Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! I wonder if you were surprised at the depressing news today that we are the third most obese nation in Europe, bested only by Turkey and Malta. Almost 30% of us are seriously overweight. The figures from the World Health Organization calculated every three years show the problem in the UK is getting worse. Add to that the Royal College of Midwives findings that the proportion of overweight and obese pregnant women in Scotland reached 51% for the first time last year. Obesity is putting a huge strain on people's lives chan life chances and the NHS, something recognised by the deputy leader of the Labour Party, whose svelte picture in today's newspapers is proof that Tom Watson has shed seven stones. <laughs> he cut out sugar, put his diabetes in remission, a case of a politician actually practising what he preaches. So do we understand what is driving this trend and what could be done to reverse it? Here's our policy editor, Chris Cook. To fight obesity is to hit a moving target. Our weight's affected by an enormous range of social phenomena. What's making us plumper isn't always very simple. But it's happening. Of a sample of girls born in 1946, only 9% were overweight at the age of around 10 or 11. That was steady for 11-year-old girls born in 1958 too. It rose a touch for girls born in 1970. then for girls born in 1991, it nearly doubled to 19%. And almost a quarter of the sample girls born in 2001 were overweight at the age of 11. There is a link between poverty and child obesity. You can see that in where the highest childhood obesity rates are. The proportion of obese children in Barking, Brent and Sandwell is nearly 30%. The equivalent rate for Brighton, Richmond upon Thames and Surrey is well under half that. But poverty and obesity are more weakly connected in adults. So over 60% of adults are obese or overweight. Um, and when you look at the obesity data, uh, there's no socioeconomic patterning for men. Um, there was in the past, there isn't now. So as a population, we've all got fatter. Um, and put in, when you look at populations, the poorest tend to get fattest first and then the rest of us follow suit. It's worth remembering how much the world has changed since that 1940s generation was growing up, and not just because of the end of rationing. Sir Ben Smith says we've got to go short. That's what we housewives have been doing for six long years. In the post-war era, women did almost all housework, including cooking. They've since halved the average time they spend in the kitchen and entered the paid workforce. But it's certainly not men taking an equal share in the kitchen that's enabled this. In 1955, the average household spent 10% of their food spending on meals bought out, whether in posh restaurants or works canteens. Today, it's 35%. We also invested in technological solutions. Microwaves went from rarity to near ubiquity very fast, from being owned by under 20% of homes in the early 1980s to over 80% by the turn of the century. We've outsourced a huge amount of our cooking. That's why restaurant food takeaways are included in Public Health England's uh, reformulation program. We expect to see 20% reduction in sugar by 2020 and a 20% reduction in calories in those products by 2024. If providers don't do that, they may face new taxes to push them into line. Now, there are people who believe this sort of public health intervention is just killjoy nannying, and we shouldn't do it. They'll be vocal, no doubt, if a takeaway tax becomes the next public health frontier. Chris Cook will are joined by Naveed Satar, a professor of metabolic medicine at the University of Glasgow, who spent his career researching obesity and diabetes. Uh, professor uh, Safar, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I mean, you must, your job just must be getting tougher every year because you've got a tougher problem in this country than we had three years ago, and chances are it's going to get worse three years' time. Why are we so bad in relation to other European countries? Um, that's a really good question, Kirsty. I don't think we fully know the answers. I think um, if we were to guess at it, there's no one issue, but I think the main problem is probably 
our food culture has changed more than perhaps many other countries, uh, that we eat more dense calories um, in the population. We perhaps are somewhat less physically active, but there are good news. I mean, we probably smoke less than some other European countries, which have, still have high rates. Mm. So there's good and bad. But I think the main reason, if I was to pick one, would be actually uh, overconsumption of dense calories and, and, the, and the change in our food culture has perhaps been greater than many European countries where, um, for example, eating as families and um, not eating out is perhaps less prevalent than it is in the UK. But obviously health messages, they may be getting through about smoking, but they're not getting through about eating. So the danger is we'll be at the top of that tree next year, next three years, sorry. Well, I mean, you know, I think the piece beautifully explained that actually there, there was no issue prior to around about 1980 and then things changed. And and it also beautifully explained that actually there's been huge changes in our you know food culture and the way that we eat. So and why is it, you talk about other countries? Why you know for example take the two particularly good ones, Switzerland and Denmark. What are they doing well that we are not doing? Well, it's a misnomer. I mean, they they are also their obesity levels are going up as well, but they're going up more slowly. But um, I would suggest to you that in some of those countries they uh, less eat out, um, they eat yeah. more perhaps as families, they're probably slightly more you know, physically active. Um, you know, the simple things, um, alcohol intake in some of these countries is somewhat less than our, you know, and we're now yeah. recognizing that alcohol is a feature in, in, in weight and, for some and individuals. Reason, and the reason, because, the reason it's a feature is because of sugar. I just want to put up now the pictures of Tom Watson. Uh, sure. You know, who miraculously, um, ha having been diagnosed as type 2 diabetes, the diabetic and been on medication, looked at all the research, did all the work himself, cut out sugar in his diet and, and lost seven stones. Proof that it can be done and be done essentially on your own. Yes, it can be done. I do think, I mean, I think you've got to be careful. This isn't just about sugar. So, um, you know, we published the study uh, in Glasgow and Newcastle showing that diabetes can be reversed by undertaking, you know, big changes in diet. Um, I think Tom Watson is unusual in, in that he has been able to do it on his own, but it's a good message for the p public that actually many individuals out there, it's, no long, it's, no long, it's not necessarily about making whole scale changes to their diet, but it's actually making small, mm -hmm. sustainable changes in some of the behaviors that they have to, be, to eating better, healthier uh, you know, diets. Tom Watson is probably a bit luckier than most of our society in the sense yeah. he can afford to eat healthier. Yeah. But um, in some poorer parts of society, getting good uh, fruit and veg is not necessarily that easy or cheap. Um, whereas, you know, getting cheap calories in abundance is, you know, yeah. is, but, is but a problem. In, in terms of message, you talk about the message that Tom Watson sent out. And I wonder what you think of the message that Cosmopolitan this month sent out, which uh, put a heavier model on their cover. And, of course, there are issues now about fat shaming as well. There's the, there's the picture uh, on our screen now of uh, the front cover of Cosmopolitan. You know, I've seen it, yeah. Uh, now, tell me what you think about that. It's a difficult one, isn't it? Because you do not want to em embarrass people, fat shame people, but what message is that sending? Um, that's, that's a very good question, Kirsty. I think this, there's a couple of issues here. One, you know, um, we have to recognize many of in our society are overweight and obese, and we shouldn't be fat shaming at all. And I think the health profession is getting much better at not doing this anymore and actually being em empathic with our patients and trying to help them lose weight. Many patients who come in who are overweight or obese don't want to be overweight or obese. We all like to be a bit lighter. But as a health profession, we're getting better at talking to our patients in the way that is helpful. And, we, and you know, fat shaming is absolutely not the, the way, way to be. I'm sure the model herself would not like to, you know, would like to be lighter than she is. I mean, you know, she seems reasonably comfortable in, in the picture, but I'm absolutely sure that if, if we could give her some messaging, some advice that she could sustain and change and lose a bit of weight that she would be welcome, oh. you know, she would welcome that. And I Thank think you. that's that's the way we need to go. Thank you very much, Professor Satter, for joining us tonight.